If there was any doubt that I'm American, I'm used to one holiday being in October, not, not two, but we're here. And where else would we rather be on Thanksgiving? Oh man, great Sunday. If we have not had the pleasure to meet, my name is Jonathan, and along with my wife, Anja, we are downtown location pastors here. And uh, we'll see if we get that same applause at the end of today's message. We'll see. Uh, but no, we, uh, we are blessed to be under the leadership of the, the Pickens, Pastor Sam and Pastor Jess, who are down at our Hamilton location this morning. So praise God that we have three locations in the GTA. All right. Well... We are in our Sacred Trust series. So if you guys were not here last week, I highly encourage you, go back, check out the podcast. Pastor Sam did an awesome job of kind of setting the tone. And Sacred Trust, he was essentially talking about preaching out of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And the idea that we are compelled to do things for the spreading of the gospel, that we're compelled to do things for the spreading of the kingdom. Of course, I run a connect group. Yeah, I'm on team. Yeah, of, of course. I, uh, I'm, I'm here every Sunday. I'm compelled to. There's people that need to know Jesus. How could I not do this? He talked about how there are sometimes sacrifices and rights that we give up to serve the kingdom. And that there's this tug of war that we have. And sometimes we don't always want to do things God's way. Now this Sacred Trust series, it's a deep one because I found that the idea of Sacred Trust it's as concrete as it is abstract. It's like love. You can't just say what love is in a sentence, right? It's a, little bit, it's a little bit deeper than that. And as I was praying this week, I was trying to figure out what I should talk about, and I kept coming back to the same thing. What's the thing that I always wrestle with God on? What are the rights that I feel like I have? What is the sacred trust all about? And when I thought about the thing that I'm constantly playing tug of war with God on, it is Money. If I'm being honest, it's money. Now, I'm writing this thing on Thursday afternoon, and I'm thinking, okay, this is your first time preaching as a location pastor. All right. These people don't even really know you yet. We talk about money all the time, and, you know, what, what, is, this, is this what you want them to hear? Is this what you want them to know? But then I thought, man, if there is anybody here who thinks about money the way that I used to think about money, then absolutely this message is for you. Absolutely we have to talk about this today. Because I, money does not necessarily work the way that we realize, but it affects more areas of our life than we realize. All right, now, Jeff was making fun of me earlier today because usually I'm a t-shirt guy. Um, but I am not Warren Buffett. I don't, I, you know, I don't have mansions. I don't have... Uh, fancy cars, I don't vacation in Europe on a yacht or a boat. I don't have any of those things, right? What, I am not what the world would say, oh man, Jonathan, he is a financial guru. It's not me. But what I do have, what I have been able to, to get as a revelation is who is God. I understand the God that loves me. I understand the God that I serve. And I understand that he has a gift for us. Money is a tool and a gift, but... He wants us to use it a very special way. He wants us to use it responsibly. There's a stewardship. There's a sacrifice. The, the gift, the, the, the money, what he has, it is part of a sacred trust. Now, this message is for all of us, but it's specifically, maybe, maybe you're the person that comes to church a little bit late because you don't want to hear the offering message. Or you're here, but you've glossed over, like, oh, we're talking about money again. I, I, I'm not here for that. Maybe this is for the person that... Has, I have my thoughts about money, and I have my thoughts about the kingdom, but I don't necessarily understand what one has to do with the other. This message is for you today if you are praying for God to move in your finances, and you're trying to figure out, okay, well, why isn't X, Y, or Z happening today? This message is for you. Can we go there? You guys gave me permission. I want you to remember that. All right, so the title of today's message is Trust Fund. Thank you. Uh, now, I want to use what Pastor Sam did last week as a framework, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to use it as a framework, but what I'm actually going to be uh, preaching from is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 through 15. So, we got a mouthful, mouthful here. Stay with me as we break this down. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly 
will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. All right, you guys got it? We'll see you next week. Um, okay, so I want to give a little context here. Paul wrote a letter to the people of Corinth, right? So his first letter, stuff was getting a little bit wild down there. Like their morals were slipping. There wasn't unison. And so he went and kind of sorted some stuff out. Then he leaves. He gets another word. It's like, oh, man, stuff is still not quite where it needs to be. So he wrote another letter, 2 Corinthians. And this time, the letter was more focused on generosity and what it has to do with spreading the gospel. Now, at the time, Corinth would have been a very influential city. They would have been a prosperous city. It was a port city, like where it is on the map, ships could come in and leave, and uh, it would have been like an economic center. Truth be told, it wouldn't look that different from Toronto from an influence standpoint, except obviously in Toronto, we don't have any morality issues. Um, obviously. Um, but when it came to resourcing the church, there was other people that were nearby, other groups of people, the Macedonians and the Galatians, they had no problem being generous and, and giving towards something. The people of Corinth, not so much. So trust fund, that's the name, trust fund. We should trust God for our funds, but also God is entrusting us with his. So I thought I was being clever when I came up with this. I'm like, oh, trust, sacred trust, yeah, that, that, that's good. But then I realized because I'm not a trust fund kid, I needed to look up exactly what it was just so I made sure I wasn't talking crazy. And a trust is basically a special account where money or assets are kept and managed by a trustee for someone else, usually to provide financial support. Uh, the person who sets up the trust decides how and when the money will be used. There's stipulations to the trust. There's terms, often for a child or family member. Now, in this room, raise your hand if you are a child of God. I hope every hand's up. You are. And if you don't know you are, let me tell you that you are. Um, and that means that the trust that God has given us, this sacred trust, it's for you and it's for me, but there's a responsibility. There's, there's things specifically that we are supposed to be doing with this. All right. So I want to take you back to 2014. All right. I just graduated college and I was very much a Jonathan that still had a lot more hair than I do now. And, uh, I was about to quit my job. And the thing is, I, I knew what I wanted to do. I, now you guys call me Pastor Jonathan. Back then, people called me um, whenever they saw cockroaches or bedbugs. <laughs> I used to work for Ecolab. I was an exterminator. I, kill, I, I used to kill bugs. I used to get rid of rodents, go into restaurants. So if you want to know what restaurants are good, I can let you know and which ones you should stay away from. <laughs> and I realized that, you know, God works in crazy ways because I am a, such a blessing to my wife because she, hate bu she hates bugs. And uh, I always joke that I can't kill them anymore because the housing market is crazy. So now they just, I charge them rent. <laughs> but this may come as a surprise to you guys. I didn't want to be an exterminator. That's not... That's not really who I am. I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to make videos. I wanted to shoot stuff and cut stuff and make really dope things for people to see. I wanted to be on big screens, small screens, do film festivals, all of that. That's what I wanted to do. So 
I quit my job. I quit my job as an exterminator. I quit my nine to five, and I had one thing lined up. I had a tax refund, and I had a wedding. And I'm thinking, okay, I can pay rent this month, and I got 30 days to figure out the rest. So that's what I did. I went month one, got to month two. I figured it out again, got to month three. I kept doing that, and before I knew it, I had been working for myself for a year. I was a hustler. My dad actually changed his ringtone, so anytime I called him, every day I'm hustling by Rick Ross would come on. That's a true story. But, like, I was getting after it. And along the way, I was getting to do everything that I really wanted to do. It was awesome. I got to travel all over the United States. I got to go to other countries. I was uh, working with different artists. I got to work with pro athletes and do fashion week across the world and stuff like that. It was really cool. And along the way, I was definitely making money. But I wasn't tithing. I was not tithing. And the thing is, it's, I knew better because I had been raised in the church. I, sometimes months were good. If I was in church at the time, I would tithe. But then there'd be other times where maybe months were not as good. And in those situations, I might give, I might not. And if I was giving, it certainly wasn't 10%. See, if you would have looked at my life, you would have seen, man, he gets to travel all over the world. He gets to do this. He gets to do that. He's making money. And look at the things he gets to do with his money. He must be blessed. But how many of you guys know there's a difference between God's blessing and God's grace? I was under God's grace. I wish I, I, wish I could tell you that, you know, it was about eight, eight years that I was living this way. It wasn't even that recent. It's not like this is the guy that, oh, a couple years into his business, he figured it out and he started tithing. That is not the case. That was not the case at all. And it wasn't until really we came to this church that I started. But before that, I was kind of like the Corinthians. I wanted to be a, a, a person of culture. I wanted to influence things. I, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to be around where all the action was happening. I was an influential person. I knew about the church, but I wasn't giving to the church in any way, shape, or form. Money was always tight, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. It was always tight. But here's the thing. God loves a cheerful giver. We, Angela and I, we find this church, we decide, all right, we are going to start tithing. We are going to start building into God's kingdom. We are going to start doing things a little bit different. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Everything that I had been experiencing before was God's grace. But once we start tithing, that's when we can know God's blessing. In God's trust fund, there are rules and ways that we are meant to use money. There are terms. So, term number one, it starts with the tithe. Tithing, th this is the foundation of all things finances in our life. Like, if we can't grasp this, everything else is going to be way too complicated. It's kind of like math class. You have to build on the next thing. Otherwise, you can't go from one plus one to calculus, right? One plus one is tithing. And one plus one is always two. That is the thing, right? It is a fundamental truth about how God wants us to use our finances. Everything that we have belongs to God. Everything. And when we tithe, a lot of times we say, oh, you know, uh, generosity and tithe. Tithing is not about being generous. It's about being obedient. Like, it's, it's, it's God's. Tithing is not generosity. It's giving back to God what is already his. When the, when the first of the month comes and it's time to pay rent, you don't pay your landlord. And then they're just like, oh, man, thank you. That's so generous of you. No, this is mine. Like, you, you, this is what you're supposed to be doing. All we have is given to us by God. We can't believe the things that we say about who God is, what he is in our lives. Like, we just sang a song up here where we called God the Alpha and the Omega. So that means he's the beginning and he's the end. Right? He's the one that created everything. He, he created the hairs on your head, every star in the universe, every blade of grass on this planet. He created everything except my job opportunity. I did that. It was my talents that did that. Right? That's, that, that's how we get our jobs. God's completely, God's over here. Everything else was me. No, that's not how it works. 
James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Everything comes from God. Not just the miracles, not just the big things. Everything comes from God. Our income comes from God. Bring our first fruits. Bring the whole tithe. Tithe is 10%. Tithe is not an offering. Tithe literally means 10%. When it comes to trusting God, I feel like tithing is really the first step of whether or not we trust God. Because it's like, okay, look, I had plans for this money. I know it's time to tithe, but I had plans for this money. There was stuff that I was going to do with it. Um... I don't know, like I'm really good at using human strength. I'm really good at using human logic. All right, how about this? I'll tithe what I can afford. Maybe I'll do 5%. Is that good? I'll, I'll do 5% this month. And here's the thing. I don't know what all you guys do for a living. 5% could be a lot of money, but it's not the tithe. That's not, like, when we don't give 10%, basically what we're saying is I 100% don't trust God. It's not, a, it, it's not a dimmer switch. It's on or off. Where is our trust going to be? Ah, oh, God, I got this. Like, I know that you have these things that, that, that you want to do, and I know that you, you are way wiser than I am, but I know how my bank account works, and I know when I need to transfer this over to this, and I know what I, God, I got it. I got it. It's not a great way. It's not a great way to be. But I get it because that was me, 100%. See, like, sometimes when we start tithing, it's like having a handful of seeds, and when it comes time to tithe, we feel like we might be losing something. But when it comes time to tithe, if your only goal is holding on to what's in your hand, you're not going to have a lot of crops when it comes time to harvest. When you open your hand, when you spread the seeds, that's when God can move both in the spiritual and the material world. When we don't tithe, it's like we're shutting God out from a certain part of our lives. And I can tell you now that I know better that sounds terrifying. The idea that we would say, especially with something as significant as finances, God, this is the one area where I'm good. I don't necessarily need you here. That is terrifying. Tithing is about obedience and generosity, not generosity. So when we have the opportunity to tithe, God is checking what kind of character we have. Are we spiritually mature enough for the next step? Now we're talking about trust funds here. A lot of trust funds have maturity clauses in them. You can't receive it until you're spiritually, or you can't receive it until you're mature enough. Where are we at? When we think about God and finances, spiritually mature, are we there or are we not? So Angela and I, like I said, you know, we fast forward, we, we find C3, and we begin tithing regularly, and life changes quickly. Now, I'm obviously here today preaching into a mic, but once upon a time, you might have heard me tell a story. I go to this men's overnighter, and I get a prophetic word. Now, here's the thing. If you've never had a prophetic word, let me just tell you, it is awesome. <laughs> now, here's why. I've been saved my entire life, but I never heard God this way. The thing with prophetic word is you hear God talk to you, and you understand what he's saying because he's speaking through a human that speaks your language. All right? But here's the thing. I got one, and then I got another one, and then I got another one. It, they, were, they were stacked. God was trying to get a hold of me, and I was like, all right, God, you want your boy? All right. You're trying to get my attention. What do you got for me? It was, I, I thought it was fun. I thought it was cool because it was like, oh, God has something for me. And one time, Chrissy, she was preaching, and she said, God is calling you to ministry. He's been calling you to ministry. He's closing doors and limiting options. I was so excited to get another word from God that I never really considered what he meant when she said he's limiting my options and closing doors. I'm over here thinking, oh, God knows that I can be an indecisive person. God knows that I need to have my mind focused. It got focused. I didn't have a choice. From that time I got that word, over the next six months or so, I would end up losing six to eight different contracts. And it was all over the board. It was stuff like oh, uh, we're not, we don't want to renegotiate the contract. We actually don't need your services anymore. We're actually getting rid of a video department. Any and everything that could happen, any and every way that I could lose a job, I was losing them left and right. My, my options were being limited. Now, I had a job. I was like, okay, you know what? This will work. Things are getting a little, a, a little hazy, but I got a job in Florida. I'm going to go down to Florida. I'm going to work. I'm going I'm to do that. It's all good. 
there was a hurricane. <laughs> now, when I make contracts, I put act of God in my contracts. I've never actually had to use it. I'm not a lawyer. I only did that because that's what Google says you should put in a contract. But I had an act of God say, no, we're, we're, we're closing this one. You don't get this one, all right? He had something for me. And I, I added up everything. It was about $25,000 worth of jobs that I was losing over the span of months. Now, keep in mind, I worked for myself. And did I mention, this is when Angela is six to seven months pregnant with our first child, our only child, but, and she was about to stop working. And even my side hustles were closing. I act, I'm in the union, there was a strike. No commercials, no film, no TV. We're limiting your options. But we never stopped tithing. That was the difference. We never stopped tithing. We didn't work, I mean, like, because we worked for ourselves, we didn't have auto tithe on. It's because we didn't know when money was going to come in. So whenever money did come in, we wanted to make sure that it was 10%. So it would come in, we would pray, and we would say, God, I trust you. This is yours. We are going to agree with the terms of this trust you've given us. We're going to agree with these terms that you've outlined, and we're going to trust you. And we trusted him. Our circumstances didn't stop us. Now, Jesus, take the wheel. That's a nice thing to say. It's a song if you like that kind of music. It's, it's much harder to walk out. It's easy to say, Jesus, take the wheel, until you're in the passenger seat. And then you're watching what God's doing, and you're like, all right, and, you know, cool, we're tithing. We believe it. Jesus, turn coming up. Jesus, hey, there's, you see this turn coming up, right? Hey, Jesus, are you going to slow? We trusted him. We're still here. We, we have to. And that's the difference. I'm telling you, that's the difference between grace and blessing because this time we were tithing. We put our trust in God, and the blessings, I'm telling you, they rained down. God is a God of details. I, knew, I could tell you every single thing that I lost in a contract, and I can tell you every single thing that God did above and beyond. I might have lost six or seven contracts. I had three, three contracts that renegotiated the retainer rate with me that basically covered all the money that I would have lost. It was less work because I wasn't spreading myself too thin. I could focus on a couple of clients. We both work for ourselves. Angela didn't have mat leave. God provided a way for us to get mat leave through one of our contracts. Anything that we could have wanted, it wasn't just our need. It was any new high chairs, toys, uh, a brand new car seat, brand new stroller, diapers. We didn't have to buy diapers for Isaiah until he was seven months old. It's crazy. And it was coming out of everywhere. We go down for American Thanksgiving, very much not in October. And uh, I go to my mom's house, and her real estate agent comes over, of all people. Her real estate agent came to sign some papers, and she sees Isaiah, and she goes, oh, you know, he's so cute. You guys want to take a look at some baby stuff I have? Sure. So the next day she comes, she has three bags worth of stuff to give us. And I'm not talking, like, Toronto condo trash bags. <laughs> these are the black trash bags that you stuff leaves in. There was a walker. There was clothes. There was clothes for the age he was, the, the age he was going to be. And I'm talking brand new, stickers still on, tags still on, on department store hangers. Honestly, I'm not even sure she didn't just rob a Target and stuff it in bags. <laughs> we, God was in the details. We saw the goodness of God and how he will bless abundantly those obedient to the tithe. Aside from the material things that he delivered, he delivered a peace and a contentment that you can only get from God. There's these, there's these times where, you know, we, we had never had a kid before. We didn't know what this was. It's scary enough. The, the, the stress, the tightness of the chest, all these things, there was a peace that we were able to get that came from God. Our minds were at peace. Our hearts were at peace. Our minds were calm. That's the kind of peace that we knew that we could have if we relied on the strength of the Lord who provides. Does anybody want that kind of peace today? 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10 through 11. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge your harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched so that in every way you can be uh, generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 
Term number two, trust fund term number two, always be generous. Part of the sacred trust that we have, it means that we're stewarding what God has for us. He's blessed us, and the text is clear. He never meant for us to just take this, have it, lock it in our bank, and just keep it. That's not, that's not the plan. You will be enriched, he says, so that. Those are two very important words. You will be enriched so that. Let me try this again. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. God's intention is not that we become blessing reservoirs where it just comes in and it just stays here. He intended for us to be blessing channels. Can we receive the blessings that God has given us and then in turn give that to somebody else? And maybe you're thinking, oh, man, sounds great. I would love to be generous. But being generous is only for people who have extra left over. I want to challenge you. And I want to say maybe being being generous is a fundamental requirement that God has for our finances. It's not an option. It's not an afterthought. And I, I, I get it because we do live in Toronto. I had a buddy that, t- uh, he sent me a text the other week, and it was a link to an article about the most expensive cities in North America. And then he goes, hey, congratulations, you live in the most unaffordable city in the world. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, good to hear from you. Haven't heard from you for a while. This is a random text. And so I get it. Maybe we're feeling the pressure of living here, and we think we're not able to be generous. But I would say that thinking you can't be generous actually reveals more of a heart posture. It shows that our trust is in ourselves. Our trust is in our jobs, our finances, our human strength, our abilities. If we feel like there isn't enough to be generous, who are we trusting? Because the God that I know has endless resources. The God that I know said there will always be enough. He's not a God of just enough. He's a God of abundance. So if we feel like there's not enough, are we trusting God or are we trusting ourselves? 1 Timothy 6, uh, 17 through 19 says, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all, uh, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. See how it says trust in God, not human strength? not things that we can do. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. If being generous and open-handed is the way that God wants us to live, and it clearly is because it says it so many times in the Bible in so many different ways, like why aren't we? What if we were? What if we had true life, like James is talking about, or sorry, Timothy is talking about, we had true life in being generous? Might change some things. We should pay attention because within this trust fund, God wants us to give and follow his terms. Now, if I'm being honest, my transition was not, it didn't happen overnight. I didn't go from not tithing or sometimes tithing to Angela and I go out and we invite everybody like, oh, bring me the bill. Like, it didn't happen like that. And to be honest, I'm still not necessarily where I want to be. I still want to build up my business. I still want to figure out ways that I can steward what God has given me better. That's a responsible thing to do. But I can tell that something has changed. I know that my heart has changed. Because when I think about how God is going going to bless me, it's not, oh, cool, I'm going to get this, this, and that. Now it's, amazing. God's going to give me something. How can I do that? How, how can I bless somebody else? Won't, won't it be cool if we, could, if we could donate this to somebody or this to that? There's a heart change. And I imagine that's, you know, God's sitting up there like, man, I've just been waiting for you to get here. I've just been waiting for you to figure it out. I've been waiting for you to understand you can, you can be generous with your stuff because of who I am. Don't worry about who you are. Worry about who I am. And if you knew that we served a God that was crazy generous, then we would feel more inclined, we'd probably feel more comfortable to be generous ourselves because we have a father who provides. We have a father that gives us all good things. Now, I need you guys to hear me when I say this because our hearts changed, yes. But here's, 
What that means, that doesn't mean that we don't go through stuff in life. It doesn't mean that sometimes things aren't scary. It doesn't mean that we don't feel financial pressure the way that everyone else feels financial pressure. But we, we know that we have a generous God. So we, we feel free to be generous ourselves. Verse 12 through 15. The service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves to God, uh, sorry, you think you can read and then you get a mic on the stage. Uh, by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Term number three, God's money is meant to expand the gospel and his kingdom. There was a lot of series of events that had to happen for me to get where I'm at today. And I felt like I was, it's like a spiritual onion. I kept pulling back layers. And as I got every, every layer, every layer, every layer, more revelation came. More truth came. And at the end of the day, what I came up with is like, okay, we're placed on this earth to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and expand his kingdom. That's, that's why we're here. Now, I realize, as a pastor, you would probably expect me to say something like that, but I've only been a pastor for two weeks. <laughs> and I had this revelation three weeks ago. <laughs> so, you know, you tell me. But see, like, Paul knew if the Corinthians would be able to just unlock generosity, it wouldn't just mean that the needs of their brothers and sisters would be met, but it would be so much more. It would, it would result in people having a thanks for God. I want you guys to know the blessing that we receive could be a miracle for somebody else. And when people experience miracles, they know who God is and they have an opportunity to thank God. Tithing, generosity, gratitude towards God, building the house and spreading the gospel, it all works together. About a year ago, we had one of the art stories that was planned, and it was on um, somebody on our church, Elena. And it was a story about vision builders. And she was in school. She, was, she had rent. She had bills. And she was already tithing. And she was like, um, maybe that's good enough. But she knew that she was leading people. She knew, how can I be an example to somebody else if I'm not doing it? So what did she decide to do? She decided to pour in to vision builders. And shortly after, she received one of the biggest scholarships she had ever received, and somebody literally gave her a business. She had more, she, she paid back the vision builders, she, she had more for rent, school. God is a God of abundance. When I asked her what changed for her after this, she said she was now more open-handed, and she understood why we talk about money so much, because it sets people free. And it does set people free. Sometimes I think we, we hear these messages in church and we think that the reason that churches ask for money is because the church needs money. That's not the case. God is going to build his kingdom regardless of what we do. He's God. The reason that he wants us to be givers is for our hearts. It sets us free, free from greed, jealousy, free from fear and anxiety, Fear from, uh, uh, free from lack? It's for us. We don't have to have giver's hearts, but what happens to our hearts when that happens? I joke that this is my second week being a pastor here, but the truth of the matter is I still feel ill-equipped in a lot of ways to lead here. I, I, there's revelations that I still need to have about who God is. There's Bible verses that you guys could probably quote back to me that I'm not as familiar with. But one of the reasons that I feel so confident in talking about this issue is because I've been here. God has shown me something. There's a revelation that God has given me. Look, we live in a city and a world that says there will never be enough. I know what it's like to live in the city. I know what it's like to be in a rat race. I know what it's like, the, the, the struggle, the, the stress that it has on our lives. 
I know what it's like to look at your bank account and then look at your bills and rent's coming in five days and I've already almost maxed out my credit card and I don't know what I'm supposed to do right now. I know what that feels like. I know what it's like to, to try to put everything on my shoulders and think I can do this. Let me just figure something out. Let me do something within my human strength. But eventually what happens all the time, you just become paralyzed and you can't do it anymore. I know what that feels like. I know what it's like to have your fist balled up so tight, trying to hold on to everything that you already have. Squeezing so tight that my fingernails are digging into my fist. But I'm also here to tell you that if you open your fist and you release that to God, there is freedom. There is freedom in his promises. There is freedom in his ways. There is freedom in who he is. His promises never come back void. When we, have, uh, when we listen to the promises of money, those are lies. Those are empty promises. Money is always talking. But what is our money saying? Money is going to have a spirit on it one way or another. It's either going to have God's spirit on it when we submit it to him, or it's going to have a spirit of mammon. Mammon's going to say a lot of things to you. I can give you identity. I can give you safety. I'll care for you. You want significance? I'll, I'll make you significant. Money's going to tell you that it can save you. Money cannot save you. When we close our hands and we're trying to hold on to mammon, we're never going to have freedom. Jesus is the one who saves. And we know this. That's why we expand the kingdom. That's why we do this. Ellen hit the nail on the head. She gave to vision builders and her heart was set free. But it also set kingdom seeds for kingdom impact. Now, practically speaking, like we know vision builders, okay, what, uh, yeah, it goes toward buildings and we want to build schools. It goes toward community outreach, but it does something else. It creates environments for people to meet God. It creates environments for people to know God. It creates environments for people to give thanks to God, to experience God. It, and when you experience God and you know who he is, then we understand why he's the ultimate giver. We understand why we can never outgive God. And it's because of what verse 15 says. It's because of this indescribable gift that God has already given us. That gift is Jesus and salvation. God gave. God gave. God gives. God gave his one and only son for the sake of everyone. And if we truly understood what this gift that God has given us, it would be so much easier to have hearts of gratitude and generosity. So where does this leave us? What kind of responsibility do we have with this sacred trust? This gift that God has given us. It's like, hey, I, I got this thing for you. It's for you. It's for your benefit. I just need you to do it the way, use it the way that I have, have for you. If we understood that God wanted to bless us, he wants to bless us so that more people would know him and, in fact, more people would meet Jesus, would we move differently? And I know some people that hate talking about money in church. But when I was thinking about what am I going to talk about here today, downtown Toronto, C3, the very church that I found and the church that changed my life, I was transported to last week with Pastor Sam's message. I'm compelled to share this revelation with you. How can I not share this revelation with you? It will change your life. You can be a channel for someone else. It will change their life. And not just for the here and now, but for eternity. That's kingdom impact. God is good. He trusts us. Can we and will we steward what he wants to give us? I sense in this room, ever since worship, honestly, the, the, the Holy Spirit is here today. And there's, there, there's an opportunity for freedom. He's here. He's, he, he's whispering to you, trust me. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father God, Lord, today... I just ask for repentant hearts, God. Lord, any time that we have made money the Lord of our life, God, we just repent that we will, we will put our trust in you, that we will make you the Lord of our life. God, there's people here who have, who have been trapped, people who, who feel like they're in chains. And in your mighty name, today I'm declaring that there is going to be freedom. There is going to be freedom from financial burdens. There's going to be freedom from fear and, and stress and pain that is wrapped around empty promises of money. With everybody's eyes closed, if you're somebody that feels like th that, that money and the world and the spirit of mammon has had its grips on you, if there's somebody that in this room that wants freedom, that wants to live abundantly, that wants true life like God promised, I'm just going to invite you to slip your hand up right now. For anybody who thinks, man, 
I'm tired of doing it in my own strength. I'm tired of doing it my way. It's not working. I need something more. God, show up today in this room, Father. Show up today in this room. We're declaring freedom. For every person that has their, ra- their, every person that has their hand raised, God, we're declaring freedom. We're, de- we're declaring that chains will be broken in your mighty and powerful name, that people will be able to turn their hearts toward you, that the revelation that happened here today, God, let it seep into their heart where they never forget. Lord, that tomorrow and how we live our lives going forward will never be the same. In your name we pray. Amen. With our heads bowed and our eyes still closed, maybe there's some of you here who have not had the opportunity to meet Jesus. I say money cannot save you, but Jesus can. He died on the cross for each and every one of our sins. If there's anybody here who thinks, you know what, it's more than just my money. It's more, it's more than just the, the, the material things. God, I want to give you everything. I want to give you my entire life. I want to submit to you and I want to surrender to you if that's you today, in this place, if you're looking for the peace, if you're looking for the, uh, the, the saving, if you're looking for the love of Jesus, if you just slip your, hand right, slip your hand up right now. Yep, I see you. That's one. Yep, two, three, four. I see you. Five, six. The reason I'm counting right now is so that you understand that you are not alone. You are not making this decision alone. Everybody's eyes are closed. If there's anybody else, seven. Yep, I see you in the back. A couple more seconds. So good. Eight, nine. All right, we just stand up. Let's give these people who, who raise their hand a round of applause. They just made the greatest decision of their life. So we're going to say a prayer together. And we're going, to, uh, we're going to be standing in faith and believing. And if, even if you didn't raise your hand, this prayer is for you. So repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I trust you and I love you. Lord, I repent of my sins and I turn from my ways. God, I believe that uh, your son died on the cross and that he rose again. Lord, I'm declaring you my Savior and Lord of my life. Amen.